outside of the city of Dusseldorf in Germany, uh, the Dussel River runs through a nondescript valley uh, called Neander. It was named after a uh, German poet named uh, Johann Neander, and in German, it's called Neandertal. Uh, Neandertal, uh, Neandertal was mostly known in the mid-1800s for its limestone. Uh, Prussia was in the middle of a building boom, and so uh, quarry workers are basically ripping out the walls of the valley. There were caves that uh, were in the valley as well, and the quarry workers would essentially clear out the clay inside the caves and then strip the whole caves away in order to get at the limestone. And in 1856, they came across some bones. They came across this bone and 15 others from other parts of the skeleton. So this was nothing new. Um, they uh, were quite used to coming across bones, particularly of things like cave bears. And the quarry workers thought that this was a cave bear as well. However, the, uh, the owner of the mining operation was friends with a local uh, school teacher and naturalist and asked him to come take a look at the bones. And this naturalist recognized that, in fact, this was not a cave bear. This was something that looked kind of human. And in fact, this was the first bone that was recognized as a Neanderthal. This is what we think that skull looked like today. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is how we went from the left side of that slide to the right side. Uh, we all grew up with Neanderthals. We're all familiar with Neanderthals. And yet, in the past couple of years, there's been a huge amount of research and discovery about Neanderthals. So I come to you today not so much as a historian, which I'm not, uh, but as a journalist, reporting on some brand new research. And what I find really uh, exciting about this is that I'm here talking to you about it at a medical school. And there might actually be some interesting things for you in my talk today in terms of medicine, because scientists are starting to understand Neanderthals not just as uh, a collection of bones, but as li living, breathing people understanding their biology down to their very genes. So that we can actually look at Neanderthals kind of like a doctor looks at a patient. And in looking at Neanderthals, maybe we can learn something about our own biology. So um, uh, once this naturalist uh, came across these bones and recognized that they were actually not a cave bear but, but looked suspiciously human, um, he brought them <clears throat> to uh, an anatomist uh, whose name is Hermann Schaffhausen. So uh, Schaffhausen uh, took a look at these bones and tried to figure out exactly what they were. Now, it was a huge struggle for him, and you have to think about when he was doing his work to appreciate why it was so difficult. This is three years before The Origin of Species is going to be published. Evolution uh, is not there as a framework to understand and interpret the fossil record. Basically, you know, anthropologists at the time would look at uh, human anatomy and they'd see lots of variation in it around the world and basically they tried to interpret it just as um, races. So supposedly, Different races were separately created, and they had very distinct kinds of anatomy. And you could, of course, uh, rank them in a hierarchy, with, of course, Europeans being at the top. Uh, of course, there was um, some trouble with this approach because there was so much variation among the so-called races, and you would find traits uh, in different races, making it hard to distinguish exactly where you draw the line. 
So what Schaffhausen basically tried to do was to try to figure out what this thing was. Was it human? And if it was human, uh, what kind of human was it? And basically what he decided was that it must be some kind of ancient European. And to, to make the case for his argument, he would basically look at uh, ancient history. So this is something that Schaffhausen wrote. <clears throat> Even of the Germans, Caesar remarks that the Roman soldiers were unable to withstand their aspect and the flashing of their eyes, and that a sudden panic seized his army. So what Schaffhausen is trying to do is he's trying to show that Europeans long ago were barbaric. They were savages. And he was really struck by this huge brow ridge on this skull cap, which could be found, something like it could be found in some human skulls. Uh, not, he was not familiar with it among any living Europeans, but he thought, well, maybe once upon a time, Europeans were like this. Um, here's another quote I particularly like. The Irish were voracious cannibals and considered it praiseworthy to eat the bodies of their parents. <laughs> So Schaffhausen brings together all of this sort of historical material and makes the case that the Neanderthal was an ancient European. That lasted for a few decades. Uh, in the early 1900s, uh, Marcelin Boulle, a uh, French uh, researcher, uh, described the first really complete Neanderthal skeleton. And when he looked at it, it seemed very stooped and hunched. Uh, and this is uh, actually an illustration that he uh, commissioned. He really believed that Neanderthals were these um, incredibly primitive, unhuman creatures. He believed that they had uh, died out and that humans had uh, other, other roots. And this actually uh, cemented our image of Neanderthals. It was from this point on, from this image on, that Neanderthal, the term Neanderthal, became sort of a synonym for um, a brute, uh, an uncivilized person. And, you know, it, it, was, it was the kind of thing that you would use to refer to, to living people. Uh, you never hear anybody say, you know, my last boyfriend was such a Cro-Magnon. <laughs> my last boyfriend was a Neanderthal. This is, where, this is where that comes from. Basically, the past century of research into Neanderthals has been, if you could sum it up, just the undoing of that image. And one of the reasons that uh, it's been possible to undo that image is that uh, scientists have been able to find a whole bunch of Neanderthals. So we have like a population of Neanderthals to look at now. And their fossils range, depending on how you define a Neanderthal, uh, from about 200,000 years ago to 28,000 years ago. And Neanderthals lived across a huge range, all the way from Gibraltar into England, way out into Siberia. Now, uh, unfortunately, it was too bad that the first uh, really good Neanderthal skeleton happened to come an old male Neanderthal probably had a lot of arthritis because Bull was so convinced, actually uh, prejudiced, that Neanderthals weren't human that he looked at this arthritic skeleton, stooped over and so on, and thought, well, this is what they normally are. Um, he didn't actually say, well, maybe this is an old arthritic Neanderthal just like old arthritic humans are hunched over. In fact, what we know now is that the Neanderthal skeleton looks like this. This is uh, probably the best reconstruction of a Neanderthal. The one uh, caveat I give is that Neanderthals were a few inches sh shorter in general than uh, living humans. But uh, as, as you can see, uh, they looked a fair amount like living humans. Um, the main differences might be, for example, the, the rib cage, which is very stout and kind of barrel shaped. Uh, the limbs are stocky. Uh, you can look at where the muscles attach to these bones, as you can see that actually this is an incredibly strong uh, relative of living humans. 
Neanderthals actually had very big brains. They were not chimpanzees in terms of their brains. Our brains are about three times bigger than chimpanzees. Neanderthals are as well. This is actually a skeleton of a Neanderthal baby. And as you can see, just like human babies, they're born with big heads because they've got big brains. Um, you can actually reconstruct uh, Neanderthal childbirth. Uh, and so this is the skull of a baby Neanderthal in the pelvis of a Neanderthal mother. Obviously, this fossil wasn't found like this. This is a virtual reconstruction. But the, the main uh, lesson here is that childbirth was not easy for Neanderthals either because their babies had big brains. And they were using these brains. They were uh, uh, making lots of stone tools. It is not easy to make these kinds of tools. I would challenge any of you to make these tools. Uh, it is a very difficult thing. It takes paleoanthropologists a long time to master this kind of Neanderthal technology. And it's likely that they used this technology to make spear tips, to uh, butcher animals that they killed, to clean the hides, they might use for clothing, uh, all sorts of different purposes. So what you get when you look at Neanderthal skeletons and their uh, artifacts is a picture of a really impressive hunter. They probably lived mainly on big game, things like rhinoceroses uh, and uh, mastodons, and they would kill them with things like these spears. So just imagine um, trying to kill a rhino with a spear. That's all you've got. You don't get some long-range uh, rifle. Uh, you, so you can imagine that these are pretty tough, remarkable uh, people. Uh, Neanderthals had uh, a home life. This is a diagram of a Neanderthal uh, habitation, I guess you could call it. Um, it was uh, essentially um, a kind of a shelf with, a, with an overhang of rock in Jordan. And you can see how they had different areas in this, uh, in this site for different things. So they would sleep in one place, they would uh, butcher their animals in another place, uh, they would process plant food in another place. Uh, they had a home. There is a site in Iraq called Shanidar, which is particularly interesting uh, for understanding Neanderthal behavior uh, because it, it's at this place that it looks as if uh, Neanderthals had buried one of their own. It looks like there's a ceremonial burial site there and it even has flowers. So Neanderthals were placing flowers at the site of someone who had died, a fellow Neanderthal. So that says a lot about how they thought of each other. You do not see chimpanzees uh, leaving flowers at a burial site. Uh, this is something that is a particularly human kind of trait, but Neanderthals were doing it too. Uh, this is uh, a new paper that just came out recently with a beautiful uh, study on shells from Neanderthal sites. The Neanderthals would paint shells with pigment. So on the right side here, on the, the inside of the shell, it's been painted. The left side shows you the outside of the shell, which has not been painted. And it's also got a hole in it. And there are a whole bunch of these shells with holes drilled into them, presumably because this was jewelry. Uh, and so you get a picture of Neanderthals as people who were aware of themselves. I mean, you don't just put on jewelry unless you're thinking, well, this is, this is going to look good on me. This is going to tell other people, say, what tribe I belong to. Um, there's also evidence of a lot of use of ochre, which may have been used on their skin. So maybe they may have uh, painted their faces also as a way to identify themselves. So you have here this, this picture of something very uh, different than what, say, Boole was, was arguing for. Still, I mean, this is, uh, this is somebody who you would, would stop you dead in your tracks if he was walking down the street today. But uh, he's a very uh, interesting person. And so as Neanderthals have sort of physically uh, 
sort of come to life before our eyes, uh, this has raised a lot of questions about who the Neanderthals were, where did they come from, and how are they related to us? Because they're still not quite human. Now, if, if you look in Europe at a, a number of different sites, you can see that for, for many thousands of years, there were humans and there were Neanderthals in Europe. And you can, do a, you can fairly easily tell them apart. So here's a, a chart, a diagram that shows a whole bunch of different uh, traits that scientists use to distinguish humans and Neanderthals from the same time period in Europe. And you have different sites where there are Neanderthals for a while, and then um, humans for a while, and then Neanderthals come back again. Particularly in Israel, you, you see this evidence. Now, what's really interesting is that if you were to try to pick any one of these traits and say, well, ah, this is, this is, this is a key trait that distinguishes humans and Neanderthals, it's actually kind of hard. Because chances are you can find a, a, a so-called human trait in Neanderthals, and you can find a so-called Neanderthal trait in some human back at this point in history. But the whole suite of characters, if you take them together, does a good job of dividing most of these fossils. Now, these differences are, in the scope of human evolution, pretty small potatoes. So our, uh, our ancestors, ancestors branched off from the ancestors of chimpanzees and other apes maybe seven million years ago or so. And we have this record that goes back maybe six, six and a half million years of uh, fossils of hominins, that is, species that are more closely related uh, to us than to uh, chimpanzees. And so Neanderthals and us, we're way, way up in this chart, way up in the corner. In fact, uh, Neanderthals were probably one of the, the last surviving hominin species for a while until it was only us. So even, say, um, let's say maybe 50,000 years ago, there were probably, let's see, one, two, three, three, maybe four species of hominins on Earth, maybe more. We're, not, we're still finding that out. Uh, so, so what, again, what was the relationship of Neanderthals to us as, as we emerged as a species? Well, Neanderthals became uh, enmeshed in a big heated debate in, say, the late 1900s um, about uh, the origin of our species. And uh, this picture uh, from, that Mark Stone King put together a couple years ago shows you, in kind of rough detail, the four different possibilities. So the top left-hand corner, um, that's kind of like what someone like Schaffhausen might have thought, that uh, the, the sort of the human races on different continents uh, evolved from a common ancestor, but uh, they were in isolation ever since. They they evolved without any exchange with other continents. So maybe you could imagine that Neanderthals were near the base of the European branch there. In the mid to late 1900s, the picture on the upper right started to really become popular. It's called multi-regional evolution. And the idea there was actually, uh, there was just one big species of humans over the past, say, million years. There was a lot of gene flow between continents. So even though Neanderthals looked very different than, say, uh, the fossils of humans in Africa at the time, uh, you know, they were stocky and stout. Uh, humans in Africa at the time, say, from 150,000 to 50,000 years ago, very slender. Uh, they, they were just sort of subspecies, in the same way you have subspecies on Earth today, where they look different in locations, but that's just because they're adapting to their local uh, conditions. Now, in the late 1900s, some people argued for the lower left scenario. That is that... Uh, Modern humans came out of Africa, say about 50,000, maybe 100,000 years ago. There were other hominids on other continents, and they wiped them out. That all those X's mark all of these sort of uh, uh, extinct hominins, uh, and today 
the whole world is populated by humans that originated in Africa and came out very recently. And I'll get to that fourth one later. So uh, up until, say, um, 15 years ago, really the only way to, to decide between all these different scenarios was to look at bones, and bones can tell you a lot. But it turns out that bones can tell you something else if you know how to get the DNA out of them. And believe it or not, there is a fair amount of DNA in Neanderthal bones. Uh, more than anybody else, Svante Pabo um, at, the Max Planck, at the Max Planck Institute for Anthropology uh, pioneered a method for getting fragments of, of DNA out of uh, Neanderthal bones. And he started uh, with... Well, they started with where Neanderthals started, uh, from the bone that came from the bones that came from the Neanderthal Valley. Now, initially, he would just look at um, uh, he and his colleagues would look at uh, just chunks of, of genetic material from the Neanderthals, uh, and he he and his colleagues mainly they were interested in comparing uh, those chunks to chunks of, of DNA from living humans to see how similar they were, and to basically draw a family tree. Uh, this is a version that came out in 2009. And as you can see, they have taken a whole bunch of DNA from living humans, from Africa, and from elsewhere. And they looked at a number of different Neanderthal fossils from lots of different sites. And you can see that at least based on this genetic material, that they split. There's a, there's a clear split uh, between Neanderthals and modern humans. So um, if, you're, if Neanderthals were just old Europeans, then you'd expect that all those Neanderthal branches would be nested in that non-African part of the tree. But that's not what they found. What they find, uh, at least looking at this uh, sample of DNA, is a clear split. So, so what this suggests is that perhaps um, the ancestors of Neanderthals and humans lived in Africa. There was an expansion, perhaps, let's say, 300, 400, 500,000 years ago. Hominins moved into Europe, evolved into Neanderthals. Our ancestors stayed behind in Africa, and then they came out later. Now, um, the, the, the early um, signals of this split came out in, uh, in I think, their first paper in 1997. Uh, but, you know, paleoanthropologists kept saying, you know, we're not sure about this. Because we keep seeing skeletons that are, that are really hard to classify. There are not a lot of them, but there are some. So here's a 24,000-year-old skeleton. It should be after the extinction of Neanderthals. I mean, the but it looks kind of Neanderthal. It's got certain traits that are very Neanderthal-ish. And yet it's 4,000 years after you know, the main fossil record of Neanderthals peters out. So there are examples like this that just kept puzzling people. And so the, the logical thing for someone like Svante Pava to do was to get more DNA. So maybe just looking at isolated bits of DNA wasn't enough. Uh, and so incredibly, what he was able to do was to get the whole genome. Uh, and this is really just amazing that he and his colleagues were able to do this. Uh, what they had to do, actually, was to turn these caves into sort of the equivalent of, of level four biohazard sites. Because they didn't want to contaminate fossils that they were digging out of the caves with their own DNA and screw up the whole analysis. So that's Svante Pabo on the right, uh, just talking with one of his colleagues in a cave. And on the left is actually someone pulling out uh, Neanderthal bones, putting them in these packages. They would immediately get them into, uh, into boxes that they would ship off to Pablo's lab where they would analyze them. Uh, the, the main genome uh, that they studied came from a site in Croatia. And those are some of the bones on the left. But they also did an analysis of some other site, of Neanderthals from some other sites, just to do some comparison. Now, just being able to sequence the whole Neanderthal genome is an amazing thing. They, they published the whole thing earlier this year. 
but they went a step further. There's a lot more research to do on the natural genome, but uh, they already did some really uh, amazing work on this. One of the things that they wanted to know was, genetically speaking, how are Neanderthals like us and different from us? So what genes do they share with us, and what genes did we evolve after the split with Neanderthals? Now, uh, in some cases, uh, this evolution was basically um, a case where uh, you might have a different versions of a gene, alleles, in the ancestral population. So a lot of different gene variants are in the, in the ancestral population. And in humans, natural selection favors one of them. So on the right there, you can see that little red star. That's the, the uh, origin of, of an allele. Uh, and the blue uh, line there is another allele that just basically got shut out, thanks to natural selection. Um, on the other hand, uh, they were going to also look for alleles in living humans that also exist in the Neanderthal genome. So on the left, you can see the, how there are blue lines in the Neanderthals and in the living human populations, and then the, the black line is, is another allele. Um, so they were trying to compare the, these patterns, looking for these sorts of patterns, among other things, to figure out uh, how Neanderthals are related to us. So the question is, what genes do we share, and what genes don't we share? So what genes do we share? Well, this uh, was kind of a surprise. Um, one of the first um, examples actually came out of an interest in the evolution of language. So, uh, you know, language is not just sort of a, an invention. I mean, we basically, we, we have what Steven Pinker has called the language instinct. Um, you know, humans are adapted for acquiring language in a way that other animals are not. And scientists are starting to identify some of the genes that are essential for uh, our, our use of language. The first one that was identified is called FOXP2. And if that gene is mutated at all, people suffer from serious uh, deficits in language. Um, they either can't talk, or they have trouble understanding grammar, or both. Uh, and when scientists compared human FOXP2 to FOXP2 in other animals, they got a really interesting result. So one way to see how natural selection has been at work is to look at the kinds of mutations that uh, have arisen in different versions of a gene. I won't get into the details here, but basically there are some mutations that show you that uh, natural selection has been at work and others that are just neutral. They don't really matter. And it turns out, as you can see here, in the human lineage, there's actually been a lot of natural selection on FOXB2. Whereas in other lineages, it's changed very little. So it looks like FOXP2 has been evolving in our lineage. And maybe that means that this was part of the story of how we evolved language. So the question was, what about Neanderthals? What kind of FOXP2 did they have? And it turns out that they have the same FOXP2 that we have, which is actually kind of interesting when you think about it. Does that mean that Neanderthals had language? I mean, we can't say for sure, but there's certainly some really interesting things to think about. So, for example, when humans show up in Europe about 40,000 years ago, they start making lots of art. They do cave paintings, they make sculptures, and a lot of researchers think that this kind of expression goes hand in hand with language. Uh, if only to just talk about what it is you just made. Um, Neanderthals show no evidence of this kind of self-expression. So were they able to talk? Or was Fox P2 really just part of a much more complicated story? We don't know the answer, but we do know that Neanderthals had our Fox P2. Okay, what about the genes we don't share? Well, this brings me to the title of the talk. So, in us, are there any redheads here? Okay, 
So, uh, so your hair is different from the hair of most other people here. And the reason is this. Um, we produce pigment in our hair and in our skin uh, with cells called melanocytes. And they make different kinds of pigments, uh, different kinds of um, sort of little packages of pigment called melanosomes. And there are different kinds of melanin, this pigment, that we make. And some of it can make <clears throat> kind of reddish color, some of it can make darker color, brown to black color. This is a process that goes on in all animals. In us, there is a gene uh, called um, uh, MC1R. We'll see in the next slide if I got that right. Um, basically, what, what this gene does is it makes a protein that sticks on the surface of cells that are involved in making pigment. And if, the, if this receptor uh, is really active, it's going to make a lot of dark pigment. If it's not active, then you're going to end up with red hair. So Lucia Ball had a weak MC1R receptor. You do too. Um, I don't. <laughs> so, uh, so knowing this, uh, Svante Pablo and his, his colleagues were curious to check out this MC1R gene in uh, Neanderthals. So this uh, diagram, the, the main thing to pay attention to in this diagram is that, is that red arrow, R A R G 307 GLY. And what that, all that is, is it's, it's uh, a mutation in the Neanderthal um, uh, MC1R uh, gene. It's the same place where we, living humans, when we're redheads, have a mutation. But it's a different mutation, actually. Uh, uh, Pablo and his colleagues looked for this particular mutation in thousands of human subjects, couldn't find it. So they said, well, it looks kind of like what you get in redheads, but we don't know. So what they did is actually pretty cool. They, they, um, they created the gene and they stuck it in uh, cells, in monkey cells actually, and they looked at its behavior essentially. Uh, and they found that it acted a lot like our own MC1R receptors, at least in redheads. That is, that it's very weak, which suggests that uh, at least in the, uh, in the Neanderthals they were studying, uh, they had this gene that could lead to, uh, to red hair. So that's why National Geographic made this picture. Now there are a couple interesting caveats. So they, they found this gene, this red hair gene, in two different Neanderthal samples from the same cave. Now they don't know if each Neanderthal had two copies of the red head gene or just one. If it was just one, it wouldn't be a red head. But if they had two, then, then they would be. And by looking looking at it statistically, saying, all right, we found these two examples of red-headed Neanderthal. Uh, can we estimate, you know, how many redheads there were in, in Neanderthals in Europe? You know, how many Neanderthals had two copies of this gene? They say that at least 1% did. So at least 1%, maybe a lot more, were walking around with red hair. So why did they have red hair? Well, they evolved red hair separate from us. They're, they had red hair too, but not from the same mutations that we have. So it suggests that maybe they came to Europe and Asia and they evolved red hair. Now maybe it was just a mutation that popped up and it didn't really affect them one way or the other and it just kind of spread. Or maybe there was some kind of advantage. Perhaps because as you come out of Africa into uh, higher latitudes, uh, you're getting less UV radiation. Maybe it's better not just to have red hair, but pale skin, so that you can absorb uh, more UV, uh, synthesize vitamin D, and, and, and benefit from sunlight. We don't know, though. We do know that Neanderthals may have been redheaded and that they became redheaded independently from us. So that's just one example of a long, long list of, um, of genes that are different in Neanderthals than in us. 
And I, if you're interested, I, I encourage you to go and check out the, the paper where this was published because uh, this is a catalog. Uh, there are dozens upon dozens of uh, genes where it looks as if natural selection uh, favored certain genes in humans and not in Neanderthals. And the fact that the author's name, Gibbons, have anything to do with all this? <laughs> no, the fact that the name is Gibbons uh, is, is purely irrelevant. No, I didn't mean to interrupt you. But no, no, not at all. So this is, a, this is a, a news article that appeared in Science along with the paper. Ann Gibbons, uh, a science writer, wrote a long article that kind of uh, looked at a lot of these issues. And um, I adapted this list of genes from, from her article. And there are a lot of really uh, interesting things, and I think perhaps interesting to people at a medical school. Uh, because a lot of these genes are associated with all sorts of genetic disorders, whether it's Down syndrome, uh, diabetes, um, and there's one particularly interesting uh, disorder called a, a cleidocranial dysplasia, which I confess I'd never heard of until I read this paper. But what's really interesting is that uh, it's involved with the closing of the cranial sutures, uh, with the uh, development of the clavicles, uh, rib cage, teeth. There's a lot of stuff in this disorder that echoes the Neanderthal body plan. So maybe, maybe, uh, part of the evolution of Homo sapiens was involved in that gene in going from, from a kind of Neanderthal-like body plan to the more slender, high forehead kind of anatomy that we have. But obviously, uh, this is just one among many genes that, that evolved um, after the split with Neanderthals and humans. Uh, and you know, in, in the future, what I think is going to happen is that um, scientists are going to be analyzing this catalog, trying to figure out answers to a few key questions. And I think one of the, the biggest questions is going to be, why are we here and why are they gone? So Neanderthals went extinct uh, 28,000 years ago and we didn't. Um, Stephen Churchill, um, ha who is at uh, Duke University, has been arguing for a while that uh, a key development in human evolution was the ability to make much more uh, innovative tools. So Neanderthals were great making tools, but um, they weren't as creative as humans of, uh, say, 40,000, 30,000 years ago. So for example, um, early humans started to make spear throwers. So not only could they use a spear, but they could actually uh, fashion a device that they could use to whip that spear and make it go a lot further than just throwing it with your arm. Uh, they also invented bows and arrows, for example. So whatever uh, mental processes it took to start being more inventive in this way might have led to um, humans being able, for example, to get more food. Um, Churchill actually points something very interesting out in a recent paper. I'll just take you back to Shanidar. So that guy, sort of slumped over in this painting by Karen Carr, um, he was actually in pretty bad shape when he died. And among other things, he had a really bad wound to a rib. And Churchill had analyzed the wound to that rib, and he thinks that it could only have been made with human weapons. So he suggests that maybe there was some warfare between Neanderthals and humans. Now, that doesn't have to be uh, the sole factor in the extinction of Neanderthals. Obviously, Neanderthals and humans shared this planet for thousands of years, so it wasn't like uh, genocide. But maybe that was part of the story. That, that humans, you know, modern humans, had this technology. They could use it against Neanderthals. They could use it against animals for food. And that might have been part of the story of why we're here and they're not. And so we go back, actually, to where the story started with the bones. So I think that you know, in the future, scientists are going to be looking at these genes and trying to figure out, well, how do these genes influence the development of brains? So this is a, a, a 
paper that came out just recently uh, that shows that um, there's some really interesting differences in the shape of the human brain versus Neanderthal brain. We both have big brains, but the shape is somewhat different, and it might correspond to different areas in the human brain that we're developing and uh, allowing us to become more proficient um, in this sort of creative technology. Um, <clears throat> and going back again to the uh, to that baby I was telling you about, um, that baby was part of a study where uh, scientists did all, an analysis of a whole bunch of Neanderthals over their lifespan and compared them to humans. And this is very strange if you look at this graph. Um, basically, the uh, vertical axis shows you um, brain size, sort of as a percentage of the size when the, baby, when the uh, humans or Neanderthals were born. Uh, the dashes show uh, some chimpanzees, and the solid lines show humans, and then the circles, just those isolated circles, show Neanderthals. It looks as if, actually, living humans have slightly smaller brains than the Neanderthals. And this may be kind of humiliating for us, um, that you know, we're, we're small brain compared to these, these Neanderthals. But you know, bigger may not always be better. Maybe a slightly smaller brain might be better optimized for certain functions. And so maybe part of the story of human success is a smaller brain. So I just want to end by going back to this chart I showed you before. Uh, as Svante Pablo and his colleagues were looking at the Neanderthal genome and looking at all these different genes and comparing them to the genes of Africans, Europeans, people from New Guinea, people from China, they found a strange pattern. They found that, uh, that Neanderthals had genes that were a little bit more like non-Africans than like Africans. Just in a few segments of the genome. It comes to just a few percent. But what they concluded was actually that uh, what must have happened was that there was uh, perhaps a little interbreeding between humans and Neanderthals. So that lower right-hand picture that I mentioned before, that might actually be the real story of what happened to the Neanderthals. Most of them became extinct, but not before Neanderthal DNA actually entered our own gene pool. Now, you know, we live in an age now where you can go and get uh, your... Uh, your genes uh, tested. You can go and, and, and have a, you know, a personal genome done. Um, we're not quite at the point where you can have your whole genome sequenced unless you're special, say, if you're Ozzy Osbourne. So I don't know if you read about this, but um, a company called Gnome, which is getting into the personal genomics business, decided that they would uh, sequence Ozzy Osbourne's genome, which is you know, wonderful PR, obviously. <laughs> But what, was, what you can do now, now that Svante Pabo and his colleagues have created this catalog of Neanderthal DNA, is you can say, like, well, does Ozzy Osbourne have any Neanderthal DNA? He does. <laughs> and, you know, sort of as a sociological uh, exercise, it's really interesting to see how this news was received. This was considered big news, and, and somehow this was supposed to explain a lot about Ozzy Osbourne how he managed to survive a life full of drinking and carousing and so on. Well, because he had the constitution of a Neanderthal. Um, what's ironic about this is that the, um, this is the founder of Gnome, one of the founders, uh, George Church at Harvard Medical School, a real pioneer in sequencing of genomes. Uh, he had his own genome sequenced uh, as part of his research. And he's got actually three times more Neanderthal DNA in him. Uh, and I've, I've met George Church. He's a, he's a very nice guy, not a brute at all. So um, <laughs> what that means for Ozzy Osbourne, I'm not sure. But I thought maybe I would just end with this image for you to contemplate <laughs> about George Church and one of his ancestors. And with that, I just want to thank you, and um, I'd be happy to take questions if we have time.